So may I introduce Pete Cashmore, Hans Vestberg and Fabian Cousteau. Again. <laughs> well, since uh, you've all heard uh, from us uh, in the past here today, I think the introductions we can skip. Uh, let's get right down to the questions. Hans, when you're, being, uh, you're one of the leaders, you're the CEO of a, a leading uh, telecommunications company in the world, how does uh, expanding technology uh, reach out to, to, or how can it reach out to more people? You know, the, you have a, an educational project uh, that, uh, that reaches to some of the poorest communities. Uh, how does that engage those communities? Uh, it's a very good question, and, and let me start a little bit, uh, just go back to the technology revolution we see. As I said this morning when we talked, I mean, it took 100 years to get 1 billion fixed lines in the world. Now, it took uh, roughly 20 years and it's 5 billion mobile subscriptions. And uh, the only thing we know for sure, that will continue. By 2017, in our projections, it's going to be roughly 9 billion mobile subscriptions. That means that people will have more than one subscription, of course. But what is more important, I think that's so important for us here, how we can spread the word, is that it's going to be 5 billion mobile broadband users. That means that we're going to triplicate the amount of people on this earth having access to internet the next five years. So if you have that in your hands and thinking about the transformation and how transformative technology will be in the future, and all of you sitting here, you're as a consumer already transformed. We are doing a lot of consumer research on the, how you use your phone. For three years ago, all of you had a feature phone. Maybe you don't even remember it, but you had. Then you spend 95% of the time on the phone to making a phone call. Calling a friend, calling a business associate or something like that. And you spend 5% of sending an SMS. If you today have a smartphone, which many of you have in this room, you spend 75% of the time to actually do something else than calling your friend or your business associate. You check your mail, you're taking down content, you're checking the weather, you're blogging, you're twittering. A dramatic change in three years that we have seen by using smartphones. The next five years, the majority of everybody coming in to the internet, coming part of the inclusion, they will use a mobile phone. Because the majority of the Earth population will actually get access to the internet through it. And we're going to see transformation in any industry. And as I'm here, we're discussing how we can address many of those challenges. And I think that the speed of change that we see today is actually the slowest pace we're going to see in all the future. It will just increase in speed the technology evolution. I think that's where I'm starting, sort of just kicking out, out the foundation, what you can do with technology, and then we can talk about some examples. Uh, before we get to that, uh, Pete, I have a question for you as far as, uh, you're being the founder and CEO of Mashable, of course. Um, you're also kind of an icon of the connected generation. I am maybe a little old for that demographic. I, I hope not. Uh, I, I seem to feel like I should be part of that demographic. But more importantly than that, uh, when, when we hear all this bad news, um, for example, at 2 o'clock this morning, I heard some, some bad news that they've taken the oceans off the agenda. Um, as far as the negotiations, which to me personally is, is quite frustrating. Um, how can someone, any individual out there, who has those frustrations and wants to be able to do something, use your platform or connect and, and actually do something? So there's a few things. I think, um, you know, obviously increasingly we have access to government through social media. media. But um, I would actually almost go the traditional route. You know how powerful, and this is the most bizarre thing to say at a, a social media panel, when I'm going to say it, um, letter writing, you know, petitioning the traditional stuff remains incredibly powerful because we've kind of lost the art of writing the letter. 
So it's kind of it kind of does make that impact. But yeah, you can absolutely tweet members of government now. Um, you can absolutely form Facebook groups and start petitioning that way. There's many modern ways to do it. Um, but it's really, I think, about coalescing on these sites. You know, an individual can do so much, but if you can form a group, you know, obviously around this conference we formed a hashtag and, and uh, people are connecting around that. And we got it, actually it was the number one trending hashtag in Brazil, which is great, which means the people who aren't here are gonna see that and start digging in and listening. So it kind of, it amplifies what we're doing because everyone else is suddenly seeing it. So I think it's about, you know, forming connections, forming groups that'll last over time. I, uh, I just got a, a little note from, uh, from one of our uh, Twitter uh, followers, someone who's stalking us from the, uh, from the wild beyond, uh, the, the virtual world, uh, at George Matthew. And he's asking, what do you think can change the future that we want? I'm going to throw it out to the panel. Anyone can grab it. <laughs> uh, oh, it's in basically a very wide question. Uh, one thing that... I would like to mention, as you were speaking about social networks, I mean, we are doing a lot of research on consumers, and, uh, and it's, uh, it's clear that one of the deepest concerns they have is sustainable development. That is coming up when you ask them what is important. And even more frightening is that 50% doesn't know how, what to do with it. 50 then how can I support sustainable development? And then you come back to the conversation we have here and in this room. Because if we can create groups that actually are addressing ideas, sharing ideas, Im improving CO2 emission by having a debate across all the borders around the, around the world, that's what we can do in this room. That's the power you have of, of a Mashable or a Rio Plus Social. And I think that that, for me, is very important. No one has the single solution, nor a company, nor a country. It's going to be the combination of all those brains and all those stakeholders. That's the only way I see the future moving forward. And that's why we think it's important to be here uh, to actually say what we think we can contribute to, but we cannot solve everything. You know, I'm going to play devil's advocate for a second. <laughs> Population is really your basis for your market, in a sense. I mean, you sell products, you sell services, so on and so forth. Yet, we're also facing a huge population increase problem. Granted, it's finally starting to slow down a bit, and the, the, uh, the estimates from yesteryear aren't quite as, uh, as dire, or they're not quite as dire as they would have been. But this being your market, and also the crux of, of many of the problems that we're facing on our, in our environment, what can we do to address uh, things like lack of education in STEM-based uh, educational programs and such, and use the tools that you all have developed in the most poignant of ways to further that. Yeah, I would love to take that, but I'm not <laughs> sure. But uh, When it comes to education, we have spent a lot of time to discussing, creating for us for discuss the future of education. And of course, ICT will play a vital role there. I mean, just to get the, the internet connection, as we saw this morning with the village in Para, Sorokaba, that for the first time in their life had a classroom with five computers, and they were connected into this room and actually could see what is going on there. Suddenly, their whole world is opening up by bringing that solution to them. And I don't think that it should be where you're born or where you are from in the way you should want to get the education. Because education in the future is going to be digital, and anybody should be able to get that type of education. And in the latest research we have seen, it would be actually better to do the lessons, the school lessons from home, mm -hmm. and you actually do the homework at school. Because that will actually bring much more efficiency for the student to learn, to get the training individually at school, and you get the lecture sitting at home digitally. I mean, just imagine 10, 15 years from now, education can be totally different by using the technology, using the internet, and getting it to anyone that wants to study at Harvard should be able to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, another one. <laughs> this is from uh, John Rice. Uh, what is the best way to translate online communities into tangible action-oriented groups offline? Sure, so there's a few ways you can do this. I think. Um, you know, one of the most successful uh, platforms that Mashables use is we have an uh, event every year. It's called Social Media Day. It's on June 30th. We use a platform called Meetup Everywhere. And, um, you know, 
first time we did this, so there's, there's communities all around the world, and what happens, it's very distributed, right? Because the future isn't centralized, it's all about distributed communities. So anyone in any city in the world can say, hey, I'm going to have a social media day meetup, I want to meet everyone else in social media in my town. And, um, you know, they go to the site, social media day, and, um, and they can self-organize into groups. And anyone else who's in that city will see their meetup feature to just detect where you are. And, um, yeah, the first time we did it, we had 11,000 people around the world all meet up so they can meet locals in their community who are interested in social media. Um, and we're doing it again June 30th. It's just incredibly powerful because, you know, not only does it take that online network and put it offline, but those connections are lasting. So people will meet people in their own cities that are interested in the same things and they didn't know. And it's a lasting connection. They keep having meetups throughout the year, uh, keep building on that relationship. So we find that really powerful. And there's multiple tools, but we've used Meetup everywhere and it's been incredibly successful. Fantastic. I, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, I have a, a little grassroots nonprofit called Plant of Fish. And you know, the, the frustrations that we have in the field are that a lot of these communities are very poor, as you were mentioning with the favelas. Uh, they're, they're, they're people, they're intelligent, they want to do something good, they feel pigeonholed into their, into their lives. And I see the advent of technology and, and of access to communications being the solution to be able to get them not only out of the situation, but being able to get, get out there and do something. Uh, in many cases, we get a chance to get them to physically go and start doing uh, restoration projects. And the key there is that they're able to share that, that story of success, that story, that story of hope. How can we propagate this to those uh, roots that I was, uh, I was mentioning earlier of the tree so that we're able to nurture uh, a positive momentum because it seems that sometimes when we look up at the canopy or governing bodies, uh, we, we don't get the fruits that we're expecting. Well, I mean, I think Ericsson's a great example of that we don't need to wait for government to do it, that, that there are companies that are, that are doing it. And you know what, uh, you know, th this is a, a great opportunity as well. You know, it's a great opportunity for the companies. It's a win-win, essentially. No, I, I definitely believe that. I and mean, I said it in my previous panel. I mean, what we are doing, if we are, as we did in Amazonas, enabling that rural village together with the operator here in, in, in Brazil to get connectivity, I mean, that's good for our technology. It's good for our customers. It's good for our employees. It's good for our shareholders. So it's, so it's a win-win. I mean, I think that's the best way to do anything. It's actually a benefit for everyone. And I think, see, that is happening with the technology that we are rolling out around the world. That has a glue wherever you are. And um, that comes back to your question as well. I mean, I think that we're going to see more and more of uh, social behavior where you find what you are interested in and what you want to advocate for. You're going to get more and more people hooked up to that, cross the borders and do things because we're going to have so many more people having access to the internet and that's going to happen the next five years so the speed of change will just increase and the good idea the good sort of solution will be replicated very very much faster than in history and i think connectivity is key it's really incredibly transformative and i think it's going to accelerate progress dramatically i mean when I started uh, Mashable, I was actually, I was a sick kid. I missed a lot of school. I had, you know, probably like less than 50% attendance. It was terrible. I was never there. But, you know, I was at home a lot. We got an internet connection. I started just learning at home and following what passions I was into. Um, and obviously got into technology and started writing about it. And, you know, uh, what else would a sick kid do at home without an internet You can actually, you know, you can uh, really progress if you have a connection, and, and you know, we're talking about people in um, much more challenging situations can compete on almost an even playing field. That's what's so great about the internet. It's, a, it's really an, a democratic force, a real equalizer. Um, so I think it's key. You know, I, I sometimes get frustrated with the, the likes and the, the friend requests and all these sorts of things because, uh, and, and some of the, the tweets that are out there simply because I feel like if you have a tool that has so much capability, you need to make sure you use the tool in the right way so that it has the maximum impact. How can you uh, make sure that that tool is honed and used in, in the proper ways? Do you mean people are tweeting about what they have for breakfast? This is what you're saying. <laughs> for example. <laughs> I actually think that's cool. I actually don't, what I think is great about social media is it has such a low bar. 
And I don't think people should overthink it. Huh. Because when you're tweeting what you have for breakfast, there is some statistician out there logging what everyone in every country has for breakfast and coming up with some really interesting data about breakfast habits and how we can make people's diets better. Everything you put out there, you would not believe it, but you know, it's, it's actually contributing value. And you're, and you're not afraid that th that may drown out some of the other messages. I think, I think the future, and, and you know, we were just talking about this earlier, there's a lot of volume of information, and this yeah. is the next great challenge. Once everyone's connected, we haven't solved everything because suddenly we have a volume of information that is so high. And it's not just people these days. I mean, we have people in our office who are wearing these wristbands that log like all your activity, the, the Nike Plus ones, the Fitbits, and then you can go share that and you can compare to your friends. There's all these devices that are now talking to the internet. You can get something called Twine, which you put onto things and it'll start tweeting. I mean, if everything's tweeting and Facebooking, then you're gonna have a lot of data to sort through. And it's kind of part of our role at Mashable as well, is to say, well, there's so much stuff out there. What's important to my community? What do they need to know? And that's the next great challenge. But I don't think people should create less media because they're scared that they're going to drown things out. I think it's really up to the technologists to figure out, well, how do we filter this stuff? Uh, yeah. Hans? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm not checking that Twitter about breakfast is all around the world, but it's sure somebody said interesting. Uh, but, but what I would like to say is also that the barrier come down for making solution because of the mobility, the broadband and the cloud. The cloud for me is an application on the internet or something because the barrier of cost, as Pete is saying, is going down so dramatically. So when we talk about, for example, connect to learn, bringing technology education out to rural villages, you do that with a PC in the cloud. You have only a screen, a dumb screen and a keyboard. And everything else is up in internet. And you only need one internet link into the whole village and suddenly they can be part of anything. So we have brought down the barriers. And I think that's one. The other thing that I also, which Pete mentioned is that we, ha we have a forecast for 2020, it's gonna be 50 billion connected devices in the world. Mm -hmm. And of course, many of them will bring efficiency. I see in front of me that cars will be connected so traffic management in a city like Rio will be more, much more efficient. Don't go now, wait. It's a traffic jam here. They're gonna steer it. You're gonna reduce the CO2 emission. We just did in San Francisco, we're doing another, uh, uh, another experiment called social commuting. So it's a social network using the smartphone actually using the smartphone, knowing where everybody, where they are, when they're commuting, to see that there's so, as f full cars as possible going in and out of the city. And you use the social network, the mobility and the broadband. Those type of ideas, we would never come up with. But when you have all of you being part of it, then those ideas come. I kind of have a question for Hans. I'm going oh, right. to steal oh, your job. Oh, I can't wait to hear this Because this is something that's come up on our side a few times. <laughs> And it's this, and uh, at what point does connectivity go from being a, a like to have to being a need? I mean, where on the hierarchy of needs is it? Because I think most of us still think, well, you know, it's a, it's a nice to have, um, but shouldn't we be solving other problems first? <clears throat> I think that uh, we probably have passed that as consumers. That is not nice to have. I mean, we have seen that in the economical crisis that has gone past the last 20 years. In the first economical crisis, you dropped your connectivity. I cannot afford it. In the last economical crisis, nobody is dropping their connectivity. They see that as one of the most important things. And I, and I also can say that the, the tougher it is in the country, economical climate or something, the traffic and the internet and the mobility is going up. Because you need to talk to someone, you need, you need to commu uh, communicate. So I think that we have passed that where connectivity is, I, don't, I will not equalize it with anything, but I think that governments need to think about broadband infrastructure equally much as think about roads, airports, uh, any other social good. If you have a good broadband, you actually create, for every 10% of broadband penetration, you create 1% sustainable GDP. This, yeah. but only if you have solutions on top of it. The broadband as such will not help you. You need to have these things that we are talking about. Well, out of respect to the social media clock, uh, we have about 50 seconds, uh, and I'm gonna give the, the last word to Pete. Uh, do you have any last uh, thoughts before we leave the stage? It better be a good word then. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I think it really comes down to, you know, uh, 
Connectivity is incredibly valuable. It's transformative. Um, the more connected the world is, the, the better it will be and the more opportunity we have to solve some of these problems that we're facing. They're huge global challenges. Nobody can solve them alone. But if we can get the communities that are actually living these problems to, uh, to become part of the solution, if we can all unite. And that's really what this conference is about, right? It's about how do we bring social, how do we open up the conversation, and how do we solve these problems together? Well, Pete, Hans, thank you so very much for forging ahead and, and uh, leading us to a better world and hopefully some really amazing solutions so that we can start living with this planet rather than living on the planet. <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you.